about a year ago, I took a look at the first eight classic Mega Man games, some of the earliest reviews I've ever done, and I think they turned out well for the most part, but today we're going to be picking up where we left off, and I don't mean Mega Man 9. As you may know, the classic Blue Bomber isn't the only incarnation of Mega Man to exist. After the release of Mega Man 6 in 1993, I'm sure many people were anticipating for Mega Man 7, which would ideally be on the Super Nintendo. Although I'm sure there were some people seeing that for 4, 5, and 6 as well. You see, this was the 1990s, and during this time the only way to stay in the mainstream was to be cool and extreme. And Capcom must have known this because in December of 1993, Capcom released Mega Man X for the Super Nintendo, which was intended to be an edgier and more mature take on the story of Mega Man while maintaining the series' staple action platformer tropes. Certainly an interesting concept, so how did it pan out? Uh, really damn good. Well, if we're to start anywhere, this game's name must have been hella confusing to gamers back in 93. We had Mega Man, Mega Man 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and now 10? What the hell happened to 7, 8, and 9? I can only imagine how much more confusing it got for people when Mega Man 7 ended up coming out right after X got a sequel called X2. Anyway, confusing names aside, Mega Man X was Keiji Inafune's way of breathing life into the Mega Man series, and after 6 games, the last 3 of which saw very little innovation in game design, I can't blame him for wanting to do so. For this new series, Inafune also wanted to create a brand new incarnation of Mega Man. Initially, he created a character called Zero, a way of driving home the more mature tones of this new Mega Man story, but he quickly decided to give this character the role of Dorotagonist and create a different character to take over the role of main character, fearing that Zero would end up becoming negatively received by fans, although ironically enough he would end up becoming arguably the series most popular character and he wouldn't even get his own spin-off series. Thus, the design team would end up creating the series' main protagonist, Mega Man X, the final creation of Dr. Thomas Light. The game actually begins with diagnostics tests being ran on him, introducing his various abilities and designs. Basically, it introduces him as one dangerous son of a bitch, a new generation of robots created with the ability to think and feel for themselves. However, Light explains that this aspect of him is incredibly dangerous, and since Light will not live long enough to continue his research, X has been sealed away until the automated testing can verify that he's safe to release. X is later discovered by an archaeologist named Dr. Kane, who also happens to be incredibly proficient in robotics, as he creates more of these free-thinking robots called Reploids. Sounds fine, but of course since we need conflict for there to be a game, some of Kane's reploids begin to revolt and turn evil due to not being as extensively tested as X was. In order to combat these reploids labeled as Mavericks, a Maverick hunting organization called the Maverick Hunters was created to take care of these rogue reploids. The Hunters are led by the walking talking phallus Sigma, but eventually even he becomes corrupted and begins an all out war on the humans, while also managing to manipulate 8 former Maverick Hunters into joining his cause. Thus, Mega Man X is off to defeat them, while Zero stands in the background and waits for Capcom to decide when to start developing him as a character. Mega Man X, in hard contrast to the series' tradition of throwing the player into the character select screen, first has the player go through an intro stage, Central Highway, which is an incredibly well-designed first level, not just because it's fun to blow shit up, but it also introduces players to X's abilities in a pretty efficient way. X control is very similar to classic Mega Man, being able to jump and shoot, but he also has the ability to cling to walls and jump off them, as well as kick against them. He's an incredibly well-designed and fun-to-control character, and he can effortlessly take down the Mavericks attacking the city, until you get to the end and the game introduces you to Vile, X's arch rival who despite clamoring about how strong he is, is apparently too much of a bitch ass to get out of that damn mech and fucking fight man to man, or robot to robot. Vile's right armor is completely invulnerable, and this is a fantastic way for the game to utterly shit on you after making you feel so powerful. I mean I was able to destroy that big ass bee helicopter thing and now I can't even beat this purple Boba Fett impersonator. Thankfully, X's buddy Zero arrives in time to save X from Vile, blasting the jerk off and driving him away, and then giving X a nice little pep talk. From then, you're thrown onto the Maverick Select screen, and here's where things begin to resemble a Mega Man game a bit more. No pesky dialogue or anything like that. It's all about going through the eight stages, blasting through Sigma's forces, and eventually taking out the Maverick that inhabits the stage at the end. From then, he can copy their weapon and use it for himself, to defeat other enemies, use as the weakness of another Maverick, or use them in other unique ways like nabbing item drops with Boomer Quanger's Boomerang Cutter. Now, the X series was always meant to be an evolution of the classic Mega Man series, not just in terms of storyline, but also in terms of gameplay. But how do you take this and augment it without completely changing it? 
Capcom did this through X's upgrade system. Through light capsules and heart tanks, Mega Man X can power himself up to be more readily prepared for the challenges ahead. I always found it so weird that X had to obtain collectibles to increase his HP to what classic Mega Man always had by default. But to be fair, finding a heart tank and getting a nice little collection sound was always such a nice reward. Each heart tank will bump X's health up, and he can also collect sub tanks that act kind of like E tanks in the classic series. They allow him to restore his HP at any point, but X has to manually fill them up by collecting energy pickups when his health is full. However, the greatest of X's abilities can be realized through finding and jumping into the four light capsules, which allow him to equip armor parts that give him various abilities. The body part lets him reduce the damage he takes, the head part, which is hilariously mundane and basically just made for getting other extras, the ability to crush blocks with his head isn't really going to help X during combat. However, the two armor parts that help X the most, and funnily enough the two that are both mandatory upgrades he can't skip, are the leg and arm parts. The arm part allows X to charge up his X Buster shot to a fourth level, a massive pink blast which goes through enemies and does great damage, although I personally prefer his default third level charge shot. If that wasn't enough, the arm part allows X to charge up not one, not two, but all of his special weapons. Now he can do things like create a shield with a charged rolling shield that eats up weaker enemies or become totally invincible with a charged chameleon sting. My personal favorite though is the charged shotgun ice, which lets you make a makeshift sled. Now this is what the new age Mega Man is about. Penguin Bob Sleds. The leg part is by far the biggest game changer of the Mega Man X series. By grabbing this upgrade in Shield Penguin stage, X is gifted with the power to dash. Sound mundane? Well, it kind of is, but this simple action initiated with the press of a button offers X incredible versatility. X can use it to move faster, dash jump to clear large pits, and even increases wall jumping distance. It's one of my favorite things to do in any game, just blasting through levels while destroying enemies, it's great. Like I said, only two of the four armor parts are given to the player by default, meaning that in addition to being able to tackle the eight mavericks in any order, you can mix up how you play the game by changing the way you collect these extras. Like with the classic series, I personally prefer not using special weapons as part of the challenge, but I'm also a big fan of doing no armor runs. However you want to play, you can, assuming you don't want to have access to the dash and powered up charge shot. Helping in this factor is that some levels are actually affected by beating other stages. Flame Mammoth's level is a factory filled with lava that can cause big damage to X, but simply take out Chill Penguin and all that lava is frozen over, letting you obtain Mammoth's heart tank with ease. These sparks and spark mandrel stage giving you trouble? I storm eagle and they're gone, but with the added obstacle blackouts. This is the kind of stuff I love in non-linear games like this, and even without these changes, every level is just so fun to go through. The bosses are a pretty good time too. Like I said, I always enjoy taking them on with only the buster, and each of them are rocking patterns that give you the upper hand as long as you're willing to learn them. The bosses were designed to be taken on without the need for upgrades. After all, it wouldn't be very fair if you made it to the end and got soft locked for not having a certain power up, but some of these bosses will give you a run for your money without the dash. Spark Mandrel and Snake Chameleon come to mind. With the dash, they're still reasonably challenging, but without it, Mandrill's dash punch pretty much becomes near undodgeable, and Chameleon's battle becomes a luck on whether or not his ceiling spikes will fuck you over or not. Other than that, the rest of the Mavericks are pretty fair challenges, and the only battle I straight up dislike is Armored Armadillo since his armor causes the battle to take fucking forever. Thank goodness you can blow it off with Spark Mandrill's weapon. Despite these few sparks of difficulty in the boss encounters, Mega Man X's 8 Mavericks are pretty balanced in terms of stage difficulty. Mega Man X compared to the first Mega Man game is very accessible, but this game also does have some things that annoy me with its enemy placement. This game just loves to throw hallways of enemies at you. A lot of the time it'll be enemies that can soak up lots of damage, or worse yet, these Mace Joe dickheads that have shields to block your attacks and need to be engaged at close distance in order for them to drop their shields so you can get an opportunity to take them out. However, while it can get obnoxious, X is so versatile that there are tons of ways to get past these obstacles, unless you happen to choose one of these levels first and now you're just stuck with the X-Buster. After taking out the 8 Mavericks, you finally gain access to Sigma's Fortress, which is basically the equivalent to Wily's Fortress. However, unlike Wily's Castle, Sigma's Fortress is not a gauntlet. After beating one level, you'll be returned to the boss selection screen in case you want to farm energy for sub tanks or anything like that. Sigma's Fortress is a volley of challenges. The first stage has a boss fight against Vile after Zero self-destructs in an attempt to destroy Vile's riot armor and save X. After X defeats Vile, Zero gives him some final words of advice before dying, while also giving X his buster if you haven't collected the arm upgrade yet, although the two function virtually the same. Each stage of Sigma's Fortress also has a varying number of the 8 Mavericks waiting for you, and being honest, I always prefer this method to the traditional one-room boss rush. I know that boss rushes are a tradition in the series, but having them spread out in the Fortress stages makes the redundancy of 
fighting all eight of the stage bosses feel much less noticeable. It's just a lot more fun when the fights are spread out, rather than having to fight them all at once. Some of the fortress bosses are pretty cool too. I really like the battle with Vile, and Regna Bagna is a pretty fun and unique battle, but it's friggin' weird. This thing is a wall that's a face with two eyes that have three different modes and a nose, not to mention a spike floor that I'm guessing acts as teeth. I don't know. D-Rex, the third fortress boss, is pretty tough, but Boss Spider of Stage 1 is the bane of my goddamned existence. I hate this boss so much. His patterns are determined, but the fucker moves so fast once you deplete his HP and also fires his robot spider babies, who are a lot more adorable than they need to be. It's such a pain in the ass, and I never look forward to it. It just grinds the game to a halt until I can take the fucker out. Yeah! How do you like a Hadouken to the fucking eye, ass face? Oh, did I forget to mention that? You can get the fucking hot token from Street Fighter in this game through a lengthy process that involves getting every collectible. It's a bit of a pain to obtain and requires XP at full HP to use it, but it destroys everything in one hit! Time to wreak havoc on this place! Eat shit, you damaged sponge- Oh. Anyway, once you reach the end you battle Sigma in a three-phase boss fight, before engaging you, the dickhead sends his pet dog against you before directly taking you on George Lucas style. At the end is a battle against his massive battle body, something I really hope you guys get used to for the rest of this marathon. This battle can actually be very tough. Besides the fact that all of Elgardo Sigma's attack inflict massive damage even with the body armor, he's also only weak to the rolling shield or the fully charged buster, making this battle pretty long too. But with enough perseverance and sub-tank energy, you can take the madman down, finally finishing Mega Man X. The game ends with X warping outside of Sigma's fortress as he watches it crumble, before thinking about how perhaps you'll have to continue fighting for peace, a thematic that unfortunately rears its ugly head a little too far into things later in the series. For now though, this is a pretty good ending to the game, with X contemplating the inevitability of war before riding through the highway, the music adding a nice tone of victory to the whole scene. Speaking of music, my god, this soundtrack! No way dancing around it, Mega Man X has one of the greatest soundtracks in any video game. Each track just kicks ass! And not only do they sound great, but each track is great in terms of atmosphere. Every piece sounds like it was composed with the environments in mind, making the soundtrack very diverse. I love the progression of the music in Sigma's Fortress, from the slow, somber tone of the first stage as you storm the fortress, to the more action-oriented themes of the second stage and the ominous tunes of the third and fourth stages. I also love the Fortress boss theme, it just sounds so evil! and it's the perfect track for Vile as well. X also looks great. Like with the classic games, there's not that much detail in the animations, but the environments look very nice. Mega Man X, as the first game in a new series, does an extraordinary job bringing in this new generation of Mega Man. To this day, it remains a great game, although despite this, that didn't stop Capcom from giving the game a remake in 2006. Mega Man Maverick Hunter X for the PSP. Seriously, the PlayStation Portable again? Why did Capcom decide to release this and the remake of the first classic Mega Man game on that console? Nothing against it, but it seems a bit odd to keep them off the more popular handhelds or just release them on an actual console. Anyway, I was actually able to try out Maverick Hunter X via PPSSPP on my mobile phone, and it ran surprisingly well. The game gives Mega Man X a 3D makeover that looks fine enough for a portable console, but I do think that the Super Nintendo version definitely aged better visually. Music-wise, while I prefer the Super Nintendo game soundtrack, Maverick Hunter X is still packing some great tunes. The game also now supports anime cutscenes that are quite nice looking. It even comes with a movie called The Day of Sigma unlocked at the beginning of the campaign. I watched it in Fast Forward as it's really just a background story showing Sigma's descent into madness, something X4 retconned nearly 10 years before Maverick Hunter was even released, so I don't particularly care. In terms of gameplay, Maverick Hunter X is basically the same as the original, sporting similarly smooth controls and stages that are unmodified for the most part. The biggest and most notable change is one I don't quite understand. The four light capsules all had their locations in the stages changed. For example, the light part was always conveniently located in Chill Penguin stages as an unavoidable upgrade, but here it's in Flame Mammoth stage. I can understand making it not mandatory for players who prefer Mega Man X to move at a snail's pace, but why move it like that? I honestly don't get how this is supposed to improve the experience. Sigma's stages also received quite radical redesigns to incorporate more elements of the Maverick stages, but I can't help but feel that the Super Nintendo stages were more fun to go through. Aside from these minor changes, Maverick Hunter X is a pretty fun romp. That doesn't end once Sigma goes down. After beating the game, you unlock Vile Mode, where X's arch enemy becomes playable. Unfortunately, Vile ain't no base and he ain't no Maverick. This is straight up the worst part of the game for me. Val has access to three weapons on his hand, shoulder, and legs. His initial weapon lineup is small, but as he beats the eight Mavericks, he unlocks more and more toys, as well as an armor 
and an upgrade to his walking speed, but I honestly struggled to find any of Vile's weapons fun to use. Well, okay, I did enjoy his default leg weapon, the Bumpity Boom. It's got high damage and also lets him suspend himself in the air by spamming it, but the rest of Vile's weapons feel very weak. He's severely lacking in the trademark versatility that makes X so fun, while also not really having anything to make up for it. Vile also only has one music track that plays in every stage, and seriously, who thought this was a good idea? Hope you like the same generic, repetitive guitar track because that's all you hear until you reach Sigma's Fortress. You can find Vile's right arm in the stages, but the thing has a timer that goes down by a lot when you get hit, which sucks because it's got good weaponry, but I feel that you rarely get to use its full potential. With all these issues, Vile Mode is a long slog that was never any fun for me despite level design being the same, and the only other notable thing about Vile Mode is that Vile's final boss is actually a fight against X and Zero, which is cool but not enough to make up for the rest of the campaign. The game actually does attempt to develop Vile's character, explaining that he has a deep hatred for X because he's a better hunter but X got more attention? Honestly, with how little fun I had controlling Vile, I just tuned out from this shit. Vile mode is a mediocre distraction, but it is optional, and I wouldn't say it bogs down Maverick Hunter X as a game. Despite this, I can't help but feel that it still ends up not being as good as a Super Nintendo game. To clarify, I'm not insinuating that it's a bad game, but remakes are typically expected to be superior to the games they're built upon, and Maverick Hunter X not only doesn't offer anything greater than the original, but I can't help but feel that the things it does change end up making it a worse experience. And to be fair, it's hard to supersede a game that did a job as good as Mega Man X. While not my favorite game in the series, I can't deny how kick-ass this game is. With smooth controls and wonderfully versatile special moves and upgrades, X controls like a dream and every stage is a ton of fun to go through, not to mention the amazing visuals and soundtracks, as well as its great replayability. It's an amazing game from top to bottom, and I give it my highest level of recommendation. I struggle to think of many series from the 90s that managed to leave such a good first impression as Mega Man X did. But we're not even done yet, trust me folks. Next time we'll be looking at Mega Man X2, the sequel to the first game. Does it manage to supersede the original? Yes, but I'll tell you why next time. So until then, thank you for watching, hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you have a great night. Take care.